Hi guys, today I want to share with you some of my tips for losing weight and just getting overall healthier. Some of these tips can help you lose weight fast and the others are more lifelong lessons to keep the weight off. I'm not a trained dietitian or a nutritionist even, but I am passionate about health and always trying to learn more. I gain weight fairly easily, but not since I was a teenager have I been overweight. I lost 20 kilos when I was about 17, and these are the six things I've done to keep myself in check. Number one, calorie counting and weighing your food. Maybe once a year I have to do this. I slack off with my habits, I notice my clothes are fitting tighter, getting a bit of a double chin, and I've gained a few kilograms. What I don't do is go out and buy bigger clothes, because whether you have to lose 5 kilos or 20, you're going to have to drastically alter your diet and stop buying the crap and bringing it home. But it feels a lot easier when it's only 5 kilos to lose. So one of the first things I do is start calorie counting, and within a couple of months I'm on my way. All you really need is an app, some measuring cups and spoons, and a kitchen scale. And keep the scale on the kitchen counter, right where you prepare your food, because you're going to use it all the time. It's a little bit annoying at first, but you get used to it. And it's not permanent, you don't need to do it forever. Some of the more popular apps are MyFitnessPal, Noom, Easy Diet Diary, and you can usually sync these with other health apps on your phone if you're using those already. And remember it's an adjustment, some days you'll go over your calories, but don't be disheartened, use it as a learning experience. Your stomach will need to adjust to eating less food, eating different food, feeling hungry, and that's okay. When you eat a meal, it takes about 10 to 20 minutes for the hunger signals to stop hitting you. So you might finish your meal and still feel hungry, but if you just stop and wait, you'll find you quickly don't feel hungry anymore, and you didn't need to have an extra serve or an extra slice of pizza. If you do this calorie counting for two to four weeks, you'll really learn what one serve is, one teaspoon, one cup, how many grams of fat are in peanut butter, what is a tablespoon of peanut butter. It's not this, it's actually just this. What a teaspoon of butter looks like on toast. Because butter is pretty flavorful, you don't need this much to make it taste good. All these little things we forget about, and they lead to bad habits, and you end up consuming more calories than you need to every day. So you think you're eating healthy, you're putting olive oil on your salad, isn't that good for me? Yes, but maybe just one tablespoon instead of three. Because when you're trying to lose weight, you need to cut back on the calories, and fat is per gram over double the amount of calories compared to protein and carbohydrates. So that's why a trainer will recommend lowering fat and increasing protein because protein is less calorie dense but it helps you feel fuller for longer. Personally I love fat and I think it's good for me. I would probably rather lower my carbohydrate intake. You've got to find what works for you because however you end up altering your diet you kind of want to stick to that, at least until you get to a place where you can maintain your weight. Unless you're purposely trying to bulk and cut as part of a weightlifting program. Which brings me to point number two. Increase gym and movement. I personally don't need to increase my movement. Just cutting calories works well for me as I already have a fairly active job. But I know people who can keep eating the exact same amount of calories and they really increase their movement instead. 
It depends on your lifestyle and what you like to do. But I always encourage people to go to the gym, go hiking, not just for losing weight, but it's good for your mental health. After an hour or two at the gym, the endorphins start flowing and I forget all my problems for the day. So the gym has been really good for me over the years. And building muscle improves your metabolism. This is because muscle tissue is metabolically active, meaning it requires energy to maintain itself. When you have a higher proportion of lean muscle mass, your basal metabolic rate, your BMR, tends to increase. BMR refers to the number of calories your body needs to perform basic functions at rest, such as breathing, circulating blood, and maintaining organ function. Having more muscle mass can elevate your BMR because muscle tissue requires more energy to sustain than fat tissue. BMR is different for everyone, but this equation can give you a good estimate of what yours might be. Factors like your height, weight and age contribute to that. But let's say it's anywhere from 1200 to 1500 calories or more. And when you increase your movement and muscle mass, your body becomes a calorie burning machine. Additionally, strength training exercises can lead to increase in post-exercise oxygen consumption or the afterburn effect. After intense exercise, your body continues to burn calories at an elevated rate as it works to restore and repair muscle tissue. When I need to get motivated for the gym, I start by buying myself some gym clothes, something I feel cute in and I like to wear. So sign up to a gym somewhere, maybe get a personal trainer for the first month or so. I've been lifting weights for years now, but every time I join a new gym, I feel really out of my element. The equipment all looks different, I feel like I don't know what I'm doing. So having a trainer put together a program for you and working with them once a week or so means you'll get comfortable quicker. You'll know that you're using the equipment correctly, you know what you're doing when you go in there alone, and also other people in the gym know the trainers, so they may feel more comfortable approaching you and you won't feel so isolated when you're there. Number three is podcasts and education. Nutrition, like most fields, is always growing and changing. We're discovering new things all the time. And it's worth staying updated. It's worth always having it on your radar. But we don't always have the time to be researching when we have a million other things to do. Which is why podcasts are so great. Because these people read all the studies... That's what they're passionate about. It's their job. And they condense it all down for you in these hour-long clips. So look up some podcasts on nutrition and healthy lifestyles. Get into the knowledge, the science, about what's good and bad for us and why. For example, understanding the reasons for why we shouldn't consume too much sugar. What it's doing to your body. And when you know, you don't really want to do it anymore. You feel guilty. I just recently, like the other day, came across a woman on Instagram, the glucose goddess. And she talks about these things and how to eat with less glucose spikes. You know when you eat something sugary and then you crash later. So how to avoid that. And I just signed up to her mailing list with 10 recipes each month to keep your glucose levels steady. So we'll see how that goes. And if I like them, maybe I'll cook some for you. Another one I like is The Genius Life with Max Lugavere on Spotify and also posts on YouTube and also Instagram. He talks about how to live your best life as your healthiest self, how to cure and prevent diseases with the food you eat, He also goes into mental health and other topics too. Flav City with Bobby Parrish. It's a YouTube channel. US based. But you can still learn a lot from him no matter where you're from. What's good is that his channel is more accessible. He goes through the best and worst foods in the supermarket. Where a lot of us are buying food. And can afford to buy food. 
So everything he recommends is not perfect. You might have some food additives, but he tells you which ones are the best. The highest quality at least, with the least amount of junk. And he also uses them in recipes, which he shows you how to make. It's a very thoughtful channel. The Huberman Lab with Andrew Huberman. He's more of a life hack guy, not just focused on food, but he's a scientist talks about how to improve every aspect of your mind and body. He's a self-proclaimed geek, and, you know, you take the advice that you need from him, and you always learn something. Please comment if you have any other podcasts you find helpful. Number four is a gut cleanse. This I would only recommend if you're having gut issues like IBS, stomach cramps, reflux, bloating, and you have an idea that certain foods are triggering it, but you don't know how to deal with it. I recommend doing it under the guidance of some kind of a doctor or health professional, someone to keep you accountable, but also tell you exactly what you need to be doing. You fill out food diaries, and you'll show them every few weeks or so, so they can help you make adjustments. I did one a couple of years ago, for about four months, I think, under this GP, she was an old Chinese lady, so she had a deep understanding of Eastern and Western medicine, and she didn't take any crap. I can't say all GPs will have an understanding between food and health, but she really understood that food was medicine. Perhaps you'll need to do some research into someone you can see in your area. I think face-to-face -face interactions help to keep you more accountable. I was off gluten, dairy, and all plant milk, actually. This is because during the manufacturing process of these milks, there are cleaning agents and other chemicals used that are not listed on the ingredients label. Cold food, raw food, I had to cook everything. Too much fat or sugar. Food additives, the most common ones being thickeners, emulsifiers, preservatives colors, flavors, and anything with a number next to it. Um, even fruit and veg that weren't in season because of the chemicals they used to keep things fresh. Too many root vegetables, and probably more that I can't remember. I made my own sweet chili sauce and mayonnaise until she told me to stop that because of the raw egg. She just wanted me off anything that could potentially upset my gut. I was eating a lot of millet and rice porridge. I could have a handful of nuts and a couple of boiled eggs a day. I'd usually have a serving of rice, a piece of meat and green veg, snow peas or something like that, on the side for dinner. And then I'd add some tamari instead of soy sauce because of the gluten and the sweet chili sauce and mayonnaise. For lunch I used to make a chicken soup or a miso soup of some sort. She wanted me to cook everything, so I was making an apple stew when I felt like something sweet, but I stopped getting sugar cravings after a couple of weeks. It wasn't the most nutritious diet, so not something you could live on for too long, but it gave my gut a full rest. Everything I ate was either easy to digest or anti-inflammatory and soothing for the gut. While I was on the gut cleanse, I had a couple of birthday dinners, so I still tried to keep to my diet as much as possible, but I allowed myself more than I normally would, so I can enjoy the night, and I had a few drinks too. But naturally, cutting out so much crap makes you lose weight. My stomach was flat, and I never felt better. Even my skin, my complexion, was brighter and clearer, because I had cut out all the inflammatory foods. And after a few months, I went back to incorporating more food into my diet again. And I found I was able to eat food groups I had been avoiding for years. And I've tried to keep up with a lot of what she taught me in terms of food additives, fresh, local food, and anti-inflammatory foods. Number five, eat more protein and drink more water. I say drink more water because we often mistake thirst for hunger. If you find yourself snacking relentlessly, ask yourself how much water you've had that day. And eating more protein with your meals keeps you fuller for longer. 
It's often recommended to eat more protein in the morning, so you're starting off on the right foot. High protein foods include meat and fish, dry grass fed and pasture raised, slow growth if you can. For breakfast I don't recommend bacon, I think it's too processed of a food. All those deli meats are not really good for you, as yummy as they are. They're linked to pancreatic cancer. Unless it's those salami that are hung up and dried, you know, old school methods. But every now and then it's fine. Eggs, yogurt, cottage cheese, milk, beans. Think of a breakfast burrito. Cheese, nuts, quinoa, oats, breads like Ezekiel multigrain, whole wheat and sourdough, chia seeds. If you think you don't have time to make a decent breakfast in the morning, it's very simple. You just need to get up earlier. Eating is a part of self-care. You have to make time for that. I read something recently that said if you don't make time for your wellness, you'll be forced to make time for your illness. And number six, avoid the middle. Base your meals on food that's not in the middle of the supermarket. Have you ever noticed that's where all the packaged food is? All the stuff that's heavily processed has a shelf life longer than it should. It's in tins, jars, packets, tetra packs. Unless you're looking for olive oil, rice and legumes, spices and other goods to make your own food. It's really the perimeters of the supermarket where all the whole foods are, like fruit and veg, dairy and meats, freshly baked breads, and the freezer section. That's generally, not always, but generally where you're going to find the freshest food that's the best for you. And there's still a lot of stuff in the freezer and the fridges that have food additives like this. Something like this is much better. This is from a woman in my town who makes food in her kitchen and sells it. It's all fresh made and I pick it up weekly. You can see things like coconut cream. That likely came from a tin or something. But if you think of the 80-20 rule, 80% is fresh, whole food, and 20% the other stuff. It's going to help you and you don't have to focus on perfection. That's probably true for all the tips I've shared today. Calorie counting, increasing your movement, educating yourself on nutrition, doing a gut cleanse, and sticking to whole foods. It's a lifelong journey. It's not something you do for a month and then you're good. You want to aim high, but don't beat yourself up when it doesn't go to plan, because that doesn't help. Don't ever be discouraged when you gain a bit of weight, because you can always lose it again. If you stop going to the gym for a month, life gets in the way sometimes. As long as you get back into it, it's fine. You can make this fun, you can make it interesting, try things, listen to unusual podcasts, and still be disciplined. And you can do it. Thanks for watching, guys.